Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. I'm Elon Jurno. This is Scott, and that's Adam. I'm going to give very brief introductions. You can look up their full bios in the, on the conference website, and of course, you can look them up online. Adam Mossoff is a professor of law at George Mason University and a scholar of international, uh, intellectual property in particular. And Scott is a scholar of China. He has a lot of hands-on experience over the years, and now he's a PhD candidate at Tufts University. Welcome, guys. Thank you. Good to have you. So we're going to have each of them speak for about five minutes just to set some context so we can all start from a similar starting point. And we, then we invite you all to bring your questions. There's a mic in the middle. We also have, uh, we invite questions from those of you uh, watching us online. Uh, we'll bring those in as we can. I just want to encourage you, as you're thinking of your questions, try to formulate them. I'm going to challenge you to formulate your questions in the briefest possible form, the most concise formulations. And it's in, your, it's in your best interest, because then you'll maximize the amount of time the, the answers uh, will have. All right, so why don't we begin with you, Scott? Why don't you set some context for us? Earlier today, you gave a talk. Not everyone was there, though. I, I, maybe many people were, but for the benefit of the context, we all need. Sure. Thanks, Elon. Um, and allow me to start with the obvious. The notion that economic liberalization would cause political liberalization in the People's Republic of China was wrong. In fact, the PRC serves as further proof that without political liberalization, economic liberalization is fantasy. Or as Rand said, free minds and free markets are corollaries. So what is going on in the People's Republic of China? Um, the party realized that there's certain value in market-informed development. This is partly because they needed the money. Um, you know, the, the country was ravaged by World War II and civil wars, and then attempts to manage the economy tightly and leap ahead uh, failed miserably. However, they also have needed it for legitimacy. Um, ideology, the communist ideology in particular, is dead. Right? The Great Leap Forward, uh, the Cultural Revolution, kind of undermined that whole experiment. And what is left for the party is legitimization based on stability and economic benefits. Oh, economic benefits. We need to figure out a way to get some of that, which is why you see some of the, the market type reforms that are out there. But the economy has never been free. There is a difference between the lack of formal rules and freedom from government whim. If nobody tells you how to run your business, but the local noble can swoop in at any moment and confiscate what he wants, you really aren't free, right? The market is not free. Um, within the PRC, the market where it operates does so at the tolerance of the party, and it can be taken away at any moment. When the party is interested in economic results, it intervenes at its will in accordance with the three principles I outlined earlier, right? Number one, the party is out for its own power. It seeks its own power. It does what it has to do for that. Two, it is paranoid, right? It is very concerned about the potential for alternate sources of authority to develop and undermine its authority. And finally, pragmatism, meaning that there is no economic ideology. It does what it has to do within the economic realm to ensure that uh, some sort of economic development happens and the people are happy. Or if power uh, dictates that we get rid of certain beneficial economic things, that's what we do, because power remains on top. The way that this actually happens involves a number of things, such as co-opting uh, the private sector. The party actively and directly runs certain portions of the economy. And when things do not go their way, they can always step in with the gun. Therefore, within the PRC, the party commands the gun, as Mao Zedong said, and the gun commands the dollar. And this goes for foreign firms as well. Because if you're a foreign firm coming into the People's Republic in order to try to run a business or export whatever, then uh, they will put a party committee in your shop, they will use laws to manipulate what you're doing to ensure it serves their interest, not yours. Uh, of course, there's an added risk, as, as Adam will talk about, about losing your property, intellectual and otherwise. So my conclusion is gamble your money in the PRC at your own risk, because it's always subject to the whim of the party. So Adam, why don't you tell us a bit about the situation with intellectual property? I think a lot of people have heard about Chinese companies or the Chinese government 
engaging in espionage and stealing uh, IP. Tell, what's actually going on right now? Yeah, so um, you know, the context which most people hear about China today, especially in the economic uh, space, is you know, not just that they're stealing our IP, which is, which is one of the arguments one often hears, but also um, perhaps paradoxically that they are innovating that they you know, have the, some of the most patents on 5G, that they won the 5G race, um, self-driving cars, that they, they are developing a robust innovation economy with a, with a patent system. And so this is a paradox that's presented to a lot of people, like they're stealing our IP, um, but they're also innovating. Why would they need to innovate if they're stealing our IP? Um, <clears throat> and the, the theft of our intellectual property is without a doubt occurring. It has been occurring for many, many decades. Um, and continues to this date. Uh, William uh, uh, Avinina, the former director of the National Counterintelligence and Security Center, testified before the Senate last year, just last year that in 2020 alone, the Chinese Communist Party was responsible for stealing an estimated 300 to $600 billion in U.S. intellectual property and trade secrets. Um, former Bureau of Investigation Director Christopher Wet Ray stated in 2020 in another uh, uh, Senate testimony that um, that the concerted campaign of theft of intellectual property uh, by U of U.S. innovators represented quote one of the largest transfers of wealth in human history end quote um, so you 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 know this is being done through a variety of mechanisms espionage but also coerced uh, tech transfer as it's called in intellectual property circles so. Um, American companies since the late 1990s, uh, if you want to do business in China, you can't do business as a, an American company. You actually have to do business through a Chinese company. Um, China set up this, the, this legal requirement that, you, that that's how you had to operate, and, and you had to enter into, therefore, a commercial agreement with this Chinese company. And as part of this agreement, you had to promise to turn over all of your IP all of your trade secrets. But don't worry, they promised they would respect them and they wouldn't share them with anyone. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so this has been, uh, it's called tech transfer, of course tech transfer, and it's been a, you know, a principal issue of, of concern and it's been a way in which China actually has obtained most of their uh, tech knowledge and, tech, uh, and innovation from the US. It's not been through espionage, it's actually through these mechanisms like tech transfer. Um, and yet at the same time, while they're doing this, they're creating the structure of what looks like the legal, legal system you need for an innovation economy. They've created a very robust, sophisticated patent system over the past six or eight years. Uh, in fact, they copied it from the United States. <laughs> While we weakened our patent system, they actually haven't weakened theirs. They've copied the original patent system that we had. They've put into place all of these courts that run like courts. They look and act like courts. Um, so it can be very confusing. Um, to people, it's like, well, they're creating a lot of their own innovation, but at the same time, they're stealing innovation from us. And, uh, and I think the, the, the integrating factor is the point that Scott uh, just elegantly and, and compellingly uh, made in his uh, talk earlier today, that, you know, the, the, is that they are both part and parcel of a broader concerted effort by China, which views innovation, whether homegrown or stolen from foreign innovators, as a, as, as a key to its future success in the geopolitical arena. So China wants power, they want control, they're a very authoritarian government, and they view and understand innovation as a key part of that. Um, and in fact, they particularly are interested in, 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 in exercising control and defining the ongoing telecommunications market. So especially since, for instance, 5G. Um, they understand that he who controls 5G gets to control what's set over the 5G network and what information is transferred over the 5G uh, network. And this is particularly concerning given as we integrate more and more aspects of our economy and our lives into our telecommunication systems. So, you know, our, our entire financial system, our roads, our, you know, everything, um, and all of our infrastructure gets put into or, or, or communicated through was now for, you know, 4G, but can soon to be 5G and eventually 6G. Um, you know, if China is, 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 has all of the technologies and is controlling how those technologies are produced, then they will have access to controlling our economy, dictating to us what we can do or can't do, and potentially even access to our military. Um, and, you know, and we've already seen some of this happening. So um, I know you'd be really shocked to hear this, but 
uh, but Vodafone was uh, the British telecom um, giant, uh, bought uh, 5G telecommunications tech equipment or 4G telecommunications equipment from Huawei. Huawei is the large, you know, large telecom company in, uh, in China. And Huawei promised them they hadn't put in a secret backdoor. They promised them they wouldn't do that. And of course, Vodafone then discovered hundreds of billions of dollars of equipment that secret backdoors have been built into them. Um, and it's just like, well, are you shocked by this? <laughs> uh, so, um, <clears throat> you know, and, um, and, now, you know, and, you know, such things can continue in, you know, it, you know, in the U.S. or in other places, and so this is this is a real concern that you know that because in China there isn't the separation as, as Scott explained between private companies and the government. Huawei is not a private company in the way Qualcomm is or Apple is, and it's, so the extent that they are engaging in what look like private activities as private companies, those are really just instruments actually of underlying decisions that are being made by the uh, by the political powers in China, the Communist Party. Party. I want to just concretize a bit what you said. So for the benefit of people who didn't hear your talk, you had a slide earlier today with the names of major companies that we might recognize. You might see their brand names on Amazon. You might own their products, perhaps. And yet you said that in each of these cases, there were party officials who were embedded in these companies. What does that actually look like? And you said some of the CEOs are party officials. Spell out what that means. So in fairness, it does not look exactly the same in every company. But every company of note has to have within it a party committee. So there are party members who form a committee, and they do a few things. They look after party members. When dictates come from on high that it's time to study Xi Jinping thought, they organize the study sessions. And whether the CEO is actually a member of the party on that committee or not, they will provide advice mm. to the, party committee, to the uh, company on what it should do on occasion. Um, when directed by the party. Now, that doesn't necessarily happen every day, right? Where they're not necessarily calling all the shots. The party is quite often willing to kind of let things chug along. But when the party wants something, give them a call, hey, it's time. No, you need to do this. No, you need to put the back door in the uh, whatever tech you're selling now, right? No, you need to buy coal now because we said so. so and, it goes, and it goes the other way too. So um, yes. we know for a fact that the, kind of the, the trade war that, that President Trump in, in initiated had a serious impact on Huawei's bottom line. Yep. Um, you know, and, and it wasn't just the trade war. You know, we also changed a lot of our laws. We, I don't know how many people realize this. I mean, we actually had Huawei telecommunications equipment, hundreds of billions of dollars of it in this country <laughs> um, built and, 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 and put in place. And it was ripped out and replaced, and the same in Europe. Um, and it was done for exactly these types of security concerns. And the other types of prohibitions that were put on um, trading with Huawei and allowing Huawei, for instance, or having access to U.S. chips right. or, ha or, put, or, or Huawei as a massive chip manufacturer, not putting Huawei chips in our devices, in our phones and in military equipment and things of this sort, that had a massive impact on Huawei's bottom line. It had zero impact on its actual continuing R&D activities because it just kept going to the CCP and saying, um, well, we just lost $100 billion or a trillion US dollars, and they said, here's the funding, um, because you are, are part of our broader political strategy that we need to gain dominance in the, in, in the world at large. So I, I invite you all to come up to get uh, your questions answered. I have one more as moderator uh, before you get into audience questions. Adam, can you spell out a bit how some of these tech standards are agreed upon or defined so that we get a picture of, and then how China is trying to influence that? So yeah. to maybe the example of 5G or another example you think is fitting. Yeah, that's great. Um, and um, uh, this, 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 it's a really cool example. Maybe I should give a talk someday on this, on, uh, uh, of just how the private market works. So your standards, 4G, 5G, the G just stands for generation. Um, it, the technology is actually goes by the acronym CDMA. It was invented by Erwin Jacobs, the founder of Qualcomm in 1989. Um, and the, and, and um, that's a standard like Wi-Fi, like your USB thumb drives and things of the sort. And standards are set by private organizations. They're called standard development organizations. The IEEE is one. I'm a member of that. ANSI is another. I'm a member of that. ETSI, which is the European Telecommunication Standards Institute. Um, 
I'm not a member of that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but the um, you know, and they and and the, the, these organizations are about 100, 120 years old. IEEE was the very first one, um, and they they got together because they realized that people, you know, manufacturers were having difficulty making competing products and services with this new electricity that was being deployed by Thomas Edison and Tesla and others. So it would be better to get all the engineers, the manufacturers, the retailers, everyone together to talk about ahead of time, how should we create products that are interoperable with each other? So it doesn't matter if you get an Apple or if you have a Samsung Galaxy, my patent infringing Samsung Galaxy, uh, that I have, um, they, can, they can communicate with each other, they can still talk with each other. And so these are private organizations. Um, so the organization that sets the five, 4G and 5G is, is known as the 3GPP. Um, and, um, and these, as I mentioned, these are entirely private organizations. Um, and China has recognized that this is, these are important, these standard setting organizations, because he who controls the standards also can control the underlying technologies that are deployed. And so they have been very purposely and deliberately putting engineers, Chinese engineers, into the standard or setting development organizations, get, trying to get them into positions of leadership, um, <clears throat> and so that they can have a say in the deliberations, and in particular, trying to get the standard development organizations to, to incorporate Chinese technologies into their standards. Um, <clears throat> and they've been trying to influence the way that people think about this. So, that it's, so they're trying to create a narrative, for instance, that will we create a 5G? It's not true, Qualcomm did, the US innovator. But, um, but they created this narrative that a lot of people have heard that they've won the 5G race. They created it. Well, that's because they, they created this impression that they were getting all the patents on it. Um, and they have. There have been patents there. Chinese patents are issuing like thousands a day. Um, and in part, that's because they subsidize people to get patents in China. You know if you're a criminal and you're serving a criminal sentence, you can get a reduction on your criminal sentence in China if you file a patent application in China. <laughs> um, so um, I'm not kidding you. <laughs> so, uh, and um, and so, they, so they're trying to create this, um, this, this impression that we have all the patents, we have all the technology, you have to come to us. To, to, to incorporate these standards and to develop these standards and things of this sort. And this is, again, part and parcel of the broader kind of geopolitical strategy that they have. Uh, again, I just got to talk this morning, it was awesome. Um, you know, of establishing kind of their prestige and power um, in, in, you know, it, uh, worldwide and making it appear that you know, it's not the United States, it's China that is actually leading everything. They're the most innovative, they're the most powerful, they're the ones that you need to go to and deal with. So I have a lot more questions I'd like to in inject into the conversation, but let's, let's take some from the uh, queue. Uh, this is a question more for you, Scott. Um, you said earlier in uh, your talk that um, your, your analysis was that ideology, ideology is largely dead in the CCP and that it's operating very much on a pragmatic basis. Um, I wanted to count, uh, not counter that, but uh, some of my research, I've, uh, I've re I take interest in Xi Jinping, and I believe I heard that he still, in, um, some of his early writing, perhaps, takes like Marxism and the idea of a long march and like you know we're going to play this multi generational sort of like communist takeover of the world. That he still takes that seriously. Um, so I was wondering, is that view still prevalent in the CCP, and and how does that function into the way that they operate? Um, good, good question. Uh, in fact, I'll take it a step further and say, more recently, he's actually even started beating that drum again. Um, so you will hear plenty of homage to. Um, Marxist, Leninism, Mao Zedong thought, um, and there's a couple reasons for that. First of all, throughout the communist period, and you see this in other Soviet regimes, right? you cannot say anything important without paying homage to what came before. Right? I would like to start my book on appreciation of 19th century art by exclaiming how Mao's views on this subject should be our guide going forward. Right? I mean, you see this kind of stuff in, in literature. So there, there's a requirement to do so. Um, there's uh, a need to, while that ideology is no longer important for the actual operation of the country, the, it is the Communist Party, and they feel a need to, to pay homage to that in order to stay relevant and not be summarily kicked out. Another factor going on is she is trying really hard to get Xi Jinping thought canonized uh, at this next party Congress as part of the official ideology. And part of doing that is showing that he's part of the long trend. At the same time, however, 
if you look at the compendiums of his speeches, there is Confucius and Lao Tzu and other classical Chinese thinkers sprinkled throughout as well. Uh, he can hardly speak without referring to them because they do have legitimizing uh, strength within the Chinese populace. So the short answer is because he needs it for, for internal power reasons. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this question is for Adam. Mm -hmm. uh, I work for one of the major uh, wireless carriers. Um, I know that we do not have Huawei equipment in, in our network, and, and I believe that you know five years ago or so they, they, they came in and said, just we're not even going to look at that. I'm pretty sure the other major carriers are. So my first question is, I'd be curious where the Huawei equipment was embedded in the U.S.? It, um, it was in the rural areas. It was, yeah. It was inexpensive. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it was part of the federal subsidization programs for through the FCC to expand broadband access to the, to everyone. Yes. Um, As a side note, um, I used to work for a small rural carrier. We were looking at Huawei. <laughs> And as a result, some of my emails are in an FBI or uh, <laughs> file because the guy we were dealing with, his wife tried to steal secrets from Motorola. So, yeah. um, second question is about the IEEE standards. Um, I, I'm familiar with like the air interface, and I can't see where the Chinese could um, manipulate that. Um, are, are, are there other areas in the IEEE where they're, they're specifying hardware specifications, or um, how, how could the uh, Chinese take advantage of that? Uh, so the most um, standard development organizations, just very quickly, function on a consensus basis. So it's, it's, and the IEEE, in fact, uh, is fully democratic. Mm -hmm. um, and so as long as, so if you can get as many of your delegates or representatives at the meetings and and are and are re, and are proposing right that this technology, which is covered by a, uh, a Chinese patent, is should be incorporated into the standard. Then you keep doing that enough, you'll eventually succeed in having some you know in, incorporation of the technologies. Yes. I got you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, that's how it works. I have a historical question. 700 years ago, during the Mongol emperors of China, Russia was a vassal state of the Chinese empire. Uh, do you think this is about to happen again? I'm guessing that's for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I would actually, first of all, disagree with your characterization somewhat, because the Mongol empire was actually four separate empires during that time. One of them included the territory of China, and none of them included all of what present-day Russia. So it's a, not exactly like that. Um, however, to what extent is Russia about to become a vassal of the PRC? Um, I would argue that in, in the sense that we often think of it in the West, they're not looking for a vassal per se. What they would like is deference, right? The recognition by Putin or whomever comes after that ultimately it's the PRC calling the shots. I don't think they have that yet. The, PR, the uh, Russians are still pretty independent of mine in, in terms of they think they have their own interests and there are areas of competition with the PRC, um, Central Asia in particular. Um, so I don't see that at this moment, Russia rolling over and becoming a vassal of the PRC or even on all issues lending deference. The fact that they need the PRC right now certainly puts them in a weaker position, and you see them, you know, giving preferential pricing because they need uh, what the PRC has. Um, but I, I don't think they're necessarily going to roll over and, and bark whenever uh, Xi Jinping tells them to. Let's just take a moment. Are there any questions from online audience? Yes, there's a um, question for Scott. Is it possible that China will attack Taiwan like Russia did with Ukraine? And in that context, would the aid given to Ukraine from NATO make China think twice about an attack? So this is a, a complex question, as I'm sure you guessed. The PRC does not want to attack Taiwan, right? They would prefer to do it, to have Taiwan uh, become part of the mainland without having to do that. 
Um, the one country, two systems formula for Hong Kong was actually originally proposed for Taiwan. Taiwan rejected it, and Hong Kong has convinced them they were right. Um, but the, the problem is the CCP, in search of legitimacy with the communist ideology dead, um, has painted themselves into a corner a bit. They have really advocated to their populace the importance of Taiwan to the point that if the Taiwanese were to declare independence, and let's face it, they're independent today, okay? It is basically a sovereign state. They meet all four requirements of the Montevideo Convention for what a state is. They have their own foreign policy. They do their own things. But if they say that magic word, the CCP will feel that they don't have a choice for domestic reasons because they have made this so important to their people. And what did I say is the number one concern? Maintaining power. And if they think letting Taiwan go will um, lead to them losing power, then they're, gonna, then they're gonna attack. They are not going to attack short of that um, because the risk of failure are too great. It is actually a very difficult task to stage a, an invasion across those 100 nautical miles of water and then fight ashore amongst the prepared defenses and plans that Taiwan has made for the last several decades. So I don't think they will. One caveat, she put a date on it. The party has tried very carefully since 1949 not to put a date on the return. In the 19th Party Congress speech, she, in two different places, he said, national rejuvenation will be completed by 2049. In another part of that speech, he said, national rejuvenation will not be complete until Taiwan is part of China. He didn't use those words. Those are my words. Um, so he's put a deadline on it, and the party could feel pressured, especially if she is still in charge, before 2049. But right now, it's not worth it. As long as it doesn't go away, it, it doesn't impact their power to leave it be, and it puts their power at risk to attack. Yes, next question. So China steals IP. What is the West doing about that, and what should the West do about that? <laughs> Take it right? um, I Well, it's a great question, and it's one of the, and it's, it's not a problem that's unique just to China, um, because it's a problem that drives the fact that intellectual property protections are based in national laws. So, you know, England has its patent laws, the United States has its patent laws, and if you want a a patent protected in England, having a patent in the United States doesn't get you that. You have to get the patent in England. And, and so we have a bunch of treaties to facilitate and make it easier for innovators in various countries to get patents and get their patents recognized between countries. Um, but that's only under international treaties and, um, and China is not a participant in those treaties, and so we don't necessarily, we can't necessarily compel them to <laughs> through the treaties to say it. Even if, even if they were participating in the treaties, the treaties are only as effective in the international space as you're willing <laughs> to to say follow this treaty or what else. <laughs> I guess um, we'll, we'll have to go to war with you. So, um, and I don't believe anyone's ever gone to a war over a patent. So, <laughs> um, but it is incumbent upon a country to respect and protect the rights of its of its citizens under uh, and 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 to ensure that those citizens are are not having their right their their rights infringed or violated. Um, and so, to the uh, we have made it easier for people to more effectively sue for trade, uh, trade secret misappropriation, because that's the primary problem. Because patents are published, and so a Chinese researcher can read a patent and then copy it in China, and can't, you know, that's, they, we can't stop that, but that just is what happens. But they, but they have been very effectively of trying to get our trade secrets. And so uh, about three or four years ago, we enacted a new law um, at, uh, at the federal level in Congress to make it easier and quicker to sue for trade secret misappropriation in federal court against foreign agents who take trade secrets. Um, and you can be very, 
explicit with that country um, in your foreign relations. And the, the, I defer to Scott on these matters because it's outside my subject matter expertise. But you know, you know, part of the uh, of what President Trump was doing with his trade war, part of his justification for that was they are stealing our trade secrets, they are stealing our intellectual property, and then and creating products and services, and then selling those products and services back to us, and that can't can't continue. That can continue. Now, it's not the job of the government to step in and to coercively say who you can or can't trade with. But it should be the job of the government to protect the intellectual property rights. And if that entails saying to, to China, you can't sell back to us products and services that are the basis of you having stolen our technology in the first place, I think that that is an actually an appropriate action the government can take. There is an increasing popular literature out there on the cases that are being conducted in, in order to attempt to stop P IP theft here in the United States. But my advice to anybody who owns a company and is looking to retain their IP is do not manufacture your product in the People's Republic of China. Yeah, and, and, I, and I just want to add an addendum. You know, part of the problem with the, with the trade secret theft and the theft of intellectual property was a problem of the US company's own making. As I mentioned, starting in the 1990s, China said, you can come, you want cheap labor, you want us to make your iPhones, you want us to make these things, come to China, just sign these agreements where you have to transfer all your, your, your IP to us. And they, you know, they didn't have to do that. They chose to do that, and a, and a lot of those companies did so on very short-sighted, pragmatic grounds. They wanted access to the cheap labor, or they wanted access to the market. They're like, oh my, this growing market of China, billions of people. Um, you know, there you know, there are more cell phones or smartphones in China than there are than there are in the entire population of the United States. Um, so and. So they were very th that they were thinking of this in a very pragmatic, short-term perspective, and not realizing what they were doing until much later. I just want to piggyback on that and I ask you, Adam, and to connect it with some of your comments, Scott, about how there has been a fundamental misreading of China. And so, Adam, tell us a bit about how politicians in the U.S. are responding to China's approach to IP. I think you were telling me that there is a push for emulating some of what China is doing, but not the good things. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, unfortunately, you know, because China focuses on creating these narratives about winning innovation, it's part and parcel of their economic plans to you know, have people patent, and then they say, see, we've got millions of patents, um, and, um, and look at all of our scientists, and look at all the articles that we're publishing in journals and things of this sort. Um, so they create this narrative that they're winning in, in, in innovation. Um, and so unfortunately, then, a lot of US politicians are looking to that and are saying, oh, well, if they're winning, they're, they're achieving successes. We should copy that. Um, so Senator Rubio, uh, about two years ago, proposed that we nationalize the 5G network in the United States. So uh, um, because of not just the national security concerns, but also if they're, you know, hey, China's showing us that, you know, you don't have to have a, this as a private enterprise. So the way I frame this sometimes when I'm talking to congressional staffers is, great, let's turn our smartphones into Amtrak. Um, so this is, um, you know, this, you know, it's, it's just, it, we didn't win against the Soviets or any other authoritarian regime in the United States by emulating their, their, their policies. We won by recommitting ourselves and and remaining committed to our founding principles of the protections of individual rights and, and the free market. Um, and that's how, you know, and, and that's how we have, we, that's how we need to show that we will win again in this context um, and fight back against these false narratives that are created that, like, for instance, that China is actually out, out, out beating us in terms of technology. Yes. Yes, so hi. Uh, being a student of Chinese language and culture, I find the discussion particularly intellectually stimulating, so thank you very much. Uh, so I would like to pivot a little bit more towards the U.S. stage. Uh, we had this American top-ranking general a few months ago saying something along the lines that if uh, America was to engage in some sort of military confrontation with China, he would call the top Chinese general and war warned him beforehand about that. Uh, to put it into perspective, I could not imagine it happening in the Cold War context, etc. So how deep is the Chinese encroachment here in America in your eyes? 
Okay, what you're specifically referring to, and I forget the exact call, but I, I think what the general was attempting to say is that before it came to a shooting war, he would attempt to de-escalate by calling his counterpart and seeing, hey, what's going on? Let's avoid a miscalculation. Let's avoid a war that nobody wants, is what I think what his intent was. Okay? I don't think he was saying, hey, we're going to attack you. Be careful. Um, uh, it would be <laughs> more like. Sorry, if I take yeah. your point. So you're not reading it as he was a, a Chinese agent who would. No, no, no. no, yeah. no. Yeah. So, but to the question of Chinese agents, right? Overblown, but um, th there has been a tendency as the PRC rose, its economy became more dominant. Um, that there's narratives within the Western press, especially, on how we're all dependent on China now, right? Entirely fictitious, okay? Not the case economically. They're building our cheap stuff with our capital and our IP, um, completely misplaced. Um, they're increasingly powerful and people are listening to them. Nah, eh, pe people are wary, but do not believe in what they have to say. But because of this fear, I think there has been a fair amount of self-censorship in the US political establishment. Don't say that it could anger the Chinese, right? Don't say that because we need to have this other meeting now. And I think there has been a fair bit of that, which has been detrimental to US policy. And I call it our, our second-handed foreign policy, where um, within certain realms of policy related to the People's Republic of China, we have out of fear stopped pursuing our own interest and started reacting to their policy. And if you're reacting to somebody else's policy all the time, you've basically ceded cognitive control of your policy to the adversary and they are now in charge. And that's something I fear and something I've written on and argued vehemently against, so. Thank you very much. Hello, thank you for the discussion so far. Uh, my question is for Scott. I was wondering if you could comment on the strength and composition of Chinese uh, military, uh, specifically from the standpoint of, is it organized mostly from defensive, keep people out of the country? And if so, could it be shifted to an offensive capability rather quickly? Just what are your thoughts? Yeah, so it has gotten better over time. Um, eaches and tanks and numbers, I don't think is, is worth talking about here. Right. But, um, they have made a real effort to improve their hardware. Um, the weakness is the software, right? Is the reason the United States military is the best military in the world, bar none, actually has very little to do with our advanced technology. It has to do with what some of our generals call the six inches of gray matter between your ears, right? It's the fact that from, from initial entry training on, we start training our people to use their head to solve complex problems and operate effectively on the battlefield and to make decisions. And that's a weakness that the PRC has because it is so command directed. And so um, they have shifted more to be able to reach out further because they see their interest as being further afield and they are afraid of the United States penetrating into their region. They wanna be able to push the US Navy out of the first island chain and so they're trying to reach further out. But you notice the way I said that? Right? I didn't say they hope to advance here. It's like, oh my God, here comes the United States. I need to keep them out of my area. So I think even some offensive systems are kind of a fortress mindset. Okay, thank you. Are there uh, questions from online? <clears throat> oh, please. Yes, um, this is a question for Scott. In a talk at a previous OCON, you explained the way in which Eastern philosophy shapes China's foreign policy. But now you've stressed China's ideological pragmatism with respect to its approach to the economy. Have you changed your perspective on the influence of Eastern philosophy on the political situation since that previous lecture, or are foreign policy and economy distinct ideological realms for the Chinese? So good question. Um, in my, my talk earlier today, you'll notice that I did call up some of those uh, Chinese philosophical assumptions as reasons that undergird some of the principles that I mentioned, right? What is important, right? Power, it traces back to hierarchy. The, the fear of nascent uh, counter movements uh, traces back to an understanding of situational potential. I still think that to understand the leadership in Beijing, you need to understand their philosophy, whatever it is, right? Individual philosophy, ideas shape action. 
And I think that to a large extent, it is built on classical Chinese philosophy. But what does classical Chinese philosophy say about economic action? Not much, right? There's, there's a metaphysics, epistemology, ethics. There's a political system that's pretty clear. Um, but in terms of actual economic activity, frankly, the Confucians were like, mm, that's kind of dirty. I'm just going to ignore that. It's not as important. And so there's not a hardcore what is uh, economic, right? And frankly, it traces from ethics and politics. And that's much more on order, on hierarchy, on keeping people in line. So I don't think economics has ever been that important in that regard. Yes. Oh, did you want to add to that? Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Can I? Okay. Yes, please. <laughs> One of the things that was said uh, at the very beginning of this talk is that uh, the assumption that political freedom can be restricted while e economic freedom is uh, allowed, that they can be compartmentalized in a sense. And I'm not sure that's the case. Um, I, do, I do think that the vast majority of governments tend to, tend, tend to go into one of two directions. Either they're top down and that applies to everything or the United States, not now but at its founding time, was the best example of a bottom up government that allows freedom, liberty, uh, freedom and liberty in all aspects. Um, there are a few cases where that hasn't happened. The one I can think of most resembles strong economic freedom, but very little political freedom would be like uh, Auguste Pinochet and the Chicago Boys. But I think that those cases are exceptions. So my question is, Hong Kong was ruled by the British for, what, 99 years? And during this time, they came into contact with Western civilization with tourists all over the world fly to China. They've, they have internet access. They have, at what point, even if the CCP doesn't allow it, doesn't, don't the Chinese people start realizing the value of liberty, the value of free exchange of ideas, the value of um, freedom, essentially. So if you go to the streets of China and you talk, because I've never been there, so I'm asking you, and you actually talk to the Chinese people who have been modernizing, what are their thoughts on liberty? Aren't the Chinese people starting to wake up? Do you want to start with that? Because I think there's a lot in that question. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, first, to clarify, uh, I was certainly saying that you cannot have free minds and free without, I'm sorry, you cannot have free markets without free minds. Oh, I misunderstood you then. Okay. okay. Um, yeah, but to, to, to your specifics, right, at what point does that change? It, well, not, not, that wasn't your question. Your question was if we allow some economic freedom, people start to get rich, there'll be a tipping point, and they'll become free. Right? That was the, the gist of your question? If you allow economic freedom, people will realize yeah. the uh, benefits of freedom in all other areas. Right. Uh, a, a very uh, common conception in face a large part of U.S. policy from the, uh, the end of the Cold War until uh, 2017 was based on exactly that premise, right? If we just trade with them, if we just engage with them, things will get better. In fact, there's a number. Uh, it's argued whether it's 10,000 or 11,000 as a GDP you know, per capita income, basically GDP per capita, suddenly they'll demand political liberty. Uh, this is by some people called the de Tocqueville factory. The Tocqueville factor. Um, and so a lot of people in the West thought it's obvious the People's Republic of China is going to become free as soon as they hit this number. Um, but they didn't. Um, Singapore didn't either, by the way. Um, so, and that was kind of the first, oops, maybe we're wrong. Okay? The, the thing is, is those societies that, that sought political liberalization at that level they didn't just have, hey, go make money. They had ideas that undergirded that individuals should have some sort of liberty, right? That there were the Enlightenment ideas animating this, and people were thinking about those ideas and what they meant and then demanding things. The ideas, as the uh, online questioner suggested a, a few minutes ago, in the People's Republic of China are different, right? The morals that undergird that society are largely um, they're collectivists based on the Confucian ethics, and that is not what is of value. Right? That is not the standard of value, which is why 
the people on the street there love the order that Xi Jinping is providing. You know, on a daily basis, they're not messed with that much, and, you know, we're getting along. And so it's okay if I don't have a say on how the government runs things, because frankly, she's supposed to be running it, and he's doing quite well. So I, I think it's the ideas ultimately that matter, and that underlying moral system is supporting Xi's regime. Thank you. Adam, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's a great question, and, and I'm glad we had a chance to clarify. We were not saying you can separate yeah. them. In fact, you can't, and that's the point. And, and, but it, 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 was confu it's, it looked confusing initially because it appears in the short term sometimes that you can do that. But ultimately, there has to be a point where a country has to make a choice. There has to be a point where are we going to protect freedom or are we going to clamp down an X area of the people's lives to protect something else that we care about? power, prestige, control, and that had to happen in China eventually, just like it has to happen in Chile and has to happen in any other country that tries to bifurcate them. It can appear to be successful for a few years, but at some point they have to make a fundamental choice. And this is the unique objectivist perspective on, on, on countries and cultures and history, which is that we can explain why that, why that choice has to be made and why it's a fundamental choice that goes one way or the other. And it's uh, driven by ideas, not by material wealth. And because it's so confusing to people when they see countries like Venezuela and others you know, throw away massive amounts of material wealth by vote, voting in, oftentimes, <laughs> the very people who end up uh, uh, you know, being sources of tyranny and oppression. And, and that goes back to the root source of what they think is right and wrong. And I think that's, and, and that's really what we're seeing now with China because it was this, this bifurcation that they tried to make was not sustainable. And the, and the country was going to have to make a choice at a certain point in time, which was more important? What was their fundamental commitment? Freedom or, or collectivism and, and, and authoritarianism? So I want to challenge you, Scott, a bit, yeah. to going back to something in your talk where you were describing the Tiananmen massacre. So can you tell us a bit about how that, protest movement came about in the first place? What was, it, was it people seeing the benefits of a liberalized economy? Was it ideas? Was it, what, what were the mix of factors there? So a, a fantastic question. It, it is very complicated, right? So there were a number of things going on. There were rising expectations of a very classical variety in terms of, hey, the economy is getting better. Uh, we're making more money. And yet, because of government action, the prices are rising rapidly huh, I'm not getting what I thought I would get, mm. right? But the government was screwing it up. Right? The government was raising uh, prices poorly, and so I wasn't getting what I wanted. The intellectuals thought they were going to have more say. They were expecting more say, rising expectations. The government's not listening to them, mm -hmm. and they're doing things wrong. And so people start organizing. Um, there's a, a catalyzing event, the death of Hu Yaobang, who had been a, a relatively reformist general secretary who had had his position taken away um, because he was too liberal. And so they start with a um, kind of a funeral memorial that turns into a long protest. But the students had been organizing, and they set up these autonomous organizations, and they start pushing to be heard. Now, we tend to call them pro-democracy protests in the West. At the beginning, you would not have heard the word, right? A lot of anti-corruption. Uh, the government has to stop being corrupt. The government has to start providing better services. The government needs to listen to us students who know something about the way we should do things. There was a whole lot of what you hear today, hey, party, fix things, right? Now, as the protests went on and they felt they weren't being listened to the government, there was uh, a rise in uh, pro-democracy rhetoric and, and much more liberalize the government. Let, we need a new system. But in some ways, it was a reaction to not being listened to. I, I do not see those protests as, hey, we're suddenly wealthy and we should have a say too. It's the government screwing things up and we want them to listen to us. And when they wouldn't, they started asking for more. Let's take one more question here. Um. Scott, what would you advise the Pentagon in terms of what they should be doing about the Chinese Communist Party, and what would you advise uh, presidents and the State Department more broadly to do? Forget China. Okay, that's a little flippant. Uh, so um, what I think our policy, as I mentioned earlier, has become very second-handed. 
right? And so we focus too much on what they're doing and we let them determine our policy. U.S. policy should first articulate what our interests are and then what vision of the region or the world meet those interests and then set out to build it with anybody who agrees with us. And um, it's gotten some flack for some justifiable reasons, but the free and open Indo-Pacific uh, framework as first enunciated by the Trump administration in 2017 actually did this in many ways. Um, and uh, I have an article called Forget China, which actually uh, lays this out on how this, this could work, but to approach the region in a way of, this is in our interest, we're going to do this, who's with us, right? Across the components of national power, diplomatic, informational, military, and economic. Um, economic, the US doesn't have the same tools that the PRC does, right? We can't control levers and we don't want to. What we can do is decontrol, right? A, country B, we think it'd be great to have no tariff, tariffs on product X. How about next Tuesday? Done. And it let other people grow, uh, join over time and just open yourself up to trade, free trade, free transfer of people to anybody who will do that with you. Make the region great, right? And the PRC can participate in any of those initiatives it wants, but only on the terms that we and those who want to work with us set set our region of vision of the future. Thank you. Okay, so this might be a bad question, but I was wondering what the back doors mean and how they help China and profit them. Oh, it's not a bad question at all. It's, uh, so um, <clears throat> a back door is a term for uh, a secret access to a piece of technology. So computer programs or the, or the chips that are made that are used in computers can have um, uh, code put in them that allows other organizations or other people to access those devices without the person who actually is using them or owns it knowing that that's happening. And, and so in, in the high tech world, we call those back doors. Um, so like some, it's the metaphor of someone sneaking in the back door of the house as opposed to coming in the front door. And they sneak in and they can, and they can see what you're doing and they, can, and they can steal your information or anything else that you're doing on the computer. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I have, yeah, thank you. So we'll make this the last question from the floor. We'll see if there are any online and I'm going to give you each about a minute or so to wrap up if you want. Thank you. In Xi's address to the Hong Kong committee, I guess, uh, a couple of days ago, assuming the translation is correct, he said something like, patriots must uh, govern Hong Kong. So it got me thinking, uh, maybe for Scott, can you define what patriotism is for a typical Chinese person and how successful is or isn't he, Xi in leveraging that sense of patriotism? So the simple answer is someone who loves Mother China. Uh, more complex, that means you agree with the party's role as leading China and you're not going to go against us in terms of what the governing system should be. In other words, you agree with me from Xi's perspective uh, is what a patriot is. And they've used this phrasing in order to prevent uh, people from what is loosely called the democracy, dem democratic parties in Hong Kong to prevent them from running for office because they are not patriots. Uh, they have a, a test. The government gets to determine who gets to run for office, and patriotism is a huge part of that. It also ties into the anti-sedition laws and making it illegal to say anything that's derisive of the government, in, uh, either in Hong Kong or Beijing. Let me turn back to you, Adam, and give you a chance to wrap up, pull some threads together. What do you see? happening in the years to come? What should we expect? What are the priorities you would like people to focus on? Um, <clears throat> so, you know, as I, as I, to circle back to my opening remarks about how China appeared to be a paradox at first with respect to intellectual property, and then as we can kind of abstract further out and talk about the paradox of being economically free but politically authoritarian, you know, we have seen this again and again and again through history. So, 
you know, in the 1980s, I remember people saying, you know, J Japan, which had a much more kind of statist approach to their economy, <clears throat> top-down, government-directed, corporations doing things. Um, you know, everyone was saying, so Japan has shown that how, it's, how it can be done, and the United States is going to be, you know, left behind. And, you know, in, in the 50s and 60s, we were hearing this about, I wasn't alive at that time, but as I read, uh, you know, about how Russia has figured this out. They've figured out the way to make, you know, communism work. And in the 30s, it was the Nazis have figured out how to make this work. Um, and, you know, and I think, you know, it's just, you keep seeing this again and again and again when a, a authoritarian system figures out a new way of doing, using authoritarianism in the economy. Um, and, and it appears to work for a few years. And everyone then starts saying, oh my gosh, yes, yes. so there, there, there it is, and that's the solution. It's so much more efficient and, and, and effective. And it's not. And my prediction is that, you know, and I think we're starting to slowly see it start to happen, that China will, will collapse eventually. I mean, and not economically collapse in the way that you, know, that you saw in of, you know, the Soviet Union and, and Eastern Europe, but it will eventually stagnate in the way that you, know, that, that you would expect of a statist economy. Um, and because, and because you can't continue to innovate, you can't innovate in the first place. If you have you know, Xi saying you have to agree with me on everything, that, that stifles the mind, These, you know, this is what we know from first principles. And this is our contribution to conversations, not just to the broader policy discussions, but also just with people to help them see this. And, and these are some of the ways that we can get them to see the value and power of objectivism, not just in terms of living a happy life, but in understanding the world and understanding these events. Scott, your thoughts? I think the biggest mistake people make in academia, in government, of trying to understand the People's Republic of China is they assume it's just like us, right? It's different. Yeah. You, you need to have a reality-based perspective, which means you need to understand something for what it is, what is its identity, right? And the information is out there. They'll tell you the number one national interest of the People's Republic of China is maintenance of power by the party. That's been stated, right? So understand what it is first. And then try to think in a principled fashion. Don't just react to every news and sound bite you hear. Be look for the trends and remember the party comes first because that at the end of the day is how they make their decisions. Great, thank you both. Thank you all for being here. Thank you.